My name is Joseph Berger. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Kentucky, and I'm speaking on human brain evolution. This talk is the consequence of a grand rounds, uh, a teaching lecture that I prepared for the members of the Department of Neurology. Human brain evolution uh, is one that fascinates many of us, and uh, the objectives of this talk are the following. To discuss the evolutionary changes that have occurred in our brain, the drive for the increased brain size that has occurred over time, what it cost us to have an increased brain size, what the increased brain size allows us to do, and what the future portends. So to begin with, I, what I'd like to do is to compare our brains with that of mammals, particularly primates, and our uh, ancestors. <clears throat> there are a number of possible evolutionary changes that can occur in the brain. One is a change in size only. Another is a change in brain reorganization. A third is hemispheric asymmetry. And a fourth is a change in the pattern of maturation for which, at least when we compare ourselves to our ancestors, the evidence is but inferential. When discussing brain size, it's meaningless without comparing it to body size. Obviously, very large animals should have large brains, and that is true. Therefore, we have to scale for brain size, and the way that is done is with a technique referred to as the encephalization index. The brain grows proportional to the body mass uh, at a power of three quarters of the body mass. But typically, the more intelligent animals exceed this rule, and that's certainly true of humans, as is seen on this slide, who beat that law by a factor of 7.5. Now, there are certain areas of the brain that appear to have changed very little uh, in terms of dimensions and in terms of uh, their sizes. In particular, that area uh, referred to as the limbic cortex, uh, proportionate to other si areas of the brain, uh, seems to have grown uh, very little uh, from uh, animal to animal in the mammalian kingdom. However, the area of the brain that has grown very significantly is a region that is referred to as the neocortex. And one could divide the brain into the neocortex the limbic system, which is responsible for the emotions in your brain, the reptilian complex, which is uh, the seat of autonomic uh, functions, and see that uh, the true expansion has occurred in the neocortex. So on the right-hand side of this slide, as demonstrated, one sees that when one compares humans to primates, the medulla, which is this area down here, has not changed very much at all uh, relative to the rest of the brain, whereas uh, the area of the neocortex has increased by a factor of 3.2. If one were to take the human cerebral cortex and flatten it out, one would find that it would cover four type pages, whereas that of chimpanzees would cover only one page, that of a monkey only a postcard, and that of a rat, only a postage stamp. <clears throat> the areas of the brain in the neocortex that have expanded very considerably are demonstrated in this slide, and they are the areas of association. So there are portions of your cortex that are responsible for receiving signals or generating them, <clears throat> such as the uh, motor region of the, of the uh, cortex in the frontal lobes, that are responsible for initiation of movements. And there are areas that are receptive, uh, like the olfactory area for smell, uh, somatosensory for one's um, perception of sensations, uh, tactile sensations, auditory areas and visual areas. These have not changed uh, very much. Uh, in fact, relative to the rest of the brain, uh, in man, they have shrunk. Whereas the areas of the brain, in particular the neocortex, that have expanded are those referred to as association areas, uh, where one believes that uh, the signals uh, derived from or emanating from these other areas 
uh, are uh, processed. And one sees that very nicely in this particular slide where we see that the frontal areas of the brain depicted in red uh, have expanded very, very considerably. In addition to an expansion in surface area, one sees that at a molecular level, there's a significant difference as well. So uh, the human brain is approximately three times the size of that of a chimpanzee brain. But uh, in addition, at the molecular level, we see these changes. In particular, in the human brain, there's more space between the neurons, uh, such as uh, uh, in the prefrontal cortex. This extra space is believed to allow for more intraneuronal connections. The human brain contains roughly 85 billion neurons. The average uh, computer processor has about 100 million components. Each neuron is connected to about 7,000 other neurons. Therefore, there are 600 trillion connections in the human brain. Uh, that means there are 3,000 more connections in our brains than stars in the galaxy. A neuron may fire 10 times per second, influencing 7,000 other neurons almost simultaneously. And no neuron is the brain, in the brain is more than six steps from any other. Another unique feature of the human brain is our handedness. And of course, this goes with uh, language. Our brains are actually asymmetric. Uh, and it is only the human population that appears to manifest a, a strong population bias towards uh, right-handedness. Uh, the right-handedness is associated with longer and more horizontal sylvian fissures. Uh, this is the area that separates the temporal uh, lobe from the rest of the brain. Uh, it was present, as best we can tell, uh, from our, our most immediate, or rather in our most immediate ancestors, uh, but to smaller degrees, and is also present in great apes uh, to a smaller degree. This um, uh, handedness and, and language development is believed to be uh, in part uh, the reason for this asymmetry. Uh, and the asymmetry that we see is a wider right frontal lobe and uh, left occipital lobes. This is called brain petalia, and looking from the bottom surface of the brain up, uh, we see the expansion of the left occipital region and the right frontal area. The other thing that's very interesting is the brain growth that occurs following birth. And we see that the human brain, uh, as depicted on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, grows at a much faster rate following birth than is seen in our uh, primate cousins, uh, in particular uh, the chimpanzee is depicted on this slide. Our brains are also somewhat bigger at birth and that has uh, resulted in changes in pelvic dimensions uh, that one sees uh, in uh, our, um, um, <coughs> among female uh, members of the species. Uh, so uh, you see on the right hand side of the slide uh, the uh, chimpanzee pelvis uh, in the middle, uh, one of our ancestors, Australopithecus af afarensis, and uh, on the right hand side of the slide uh, what Homo sapien brain looks like and what the skull of the birthing infant looks like relative to the aperture of the pelvis um, and see that uh, it's become a, a far tighter squeeze for uh, Homo sapiens. Um, the, one of the ways that uh, brain dimension is measured in our ancestors is uh, by looking at their skulls and determining what their intracranial capacity is. This is done with endocast volumes, so uh, one can put uh, BBs or other substances into the skulls and determine exactly what volume uh, those of uh, brain those skulls held. Uh, on the slide uh, depicted here, one sees that uh, the our Australopithecus, uh, very early uh, human ancestors, had much smaller brains than uh, the Homo than Homo, the um, 
Homo sapiens and others. The Homo sapiens are far on the right-hand side of this slide, and, and we see it in this particular slide here that uh, as we moved up the evolutionary tree uh, over time, uh, brain dimension changed, as did skull dimension. Not only did the brain dimension change, but there was a change uh, that was the consequence of our walking bipedally, uh, and therefore the frame and magnum, which is the uh, opening at the bottom of the skull that uh, connects the spinal cord to the brain, moved from where it was located in our primate ancestors, such as uh, those uh, like the gorilla, uh, to uh, a spot that was more centrally located because we were no longer walking on all fours, but walking bipedally and therefore had to hold our heads erect. The venous drainage patterns of the brain also change. So as we look at the skulls of our um, uh, ancestors, one sees this change not only in the size of the skull, uh, the shape of the skull, but also in where the frame and magnum is located and in the uh, venous structures that leave their mark on the skull. Now, it's not um, complete to give a talk on human brain evolution without touching somewhat on human evolution in general. Uh, the prevailing theory is that uh, we as a species began evolving uh, approximately six and a half million years ago. Uh, the uh, earliest of our species are referred to as uh, the hominid lineage, uh, of which we are the most recent. Um, and what caused this change is believed to have been a change in the climate. Uh, and that change in the climate um, forced us out of a dense tropical forest into savanna, and therefore uh, we were dependent on uh, bipedalism, walking on two feet, uh, searching for food, uh, and uh, finding it more difficult uh, than it had been previously. Uh, that This change actually drove the um, evolution of man. And on the left-hand side of this slide, uh, one sees that the dense forest is depicted above and the savanna below. Uh, so there was a rather significant change, and this change occurred uh, in East Africa, and therefore many of the specimens of early hominids uh, are actually found in uh, East Africa along the Rift Valley um, in uh, Ethiopia, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, and down into South Africa. Now, we're not that different, actually, from our chimpanzee cousins. There is actually a 98.6% similarity between our genome and that of the chimps. Uh, and therefore, the change is really in only uh, 15 million out of uh, three times 10 to the ninth base pairs uh, that have occurred, base pairs referring to uh, each of the uh, chain, each of the links in, in our gene, uh, a difference that has occurred over six million years of evolution. Uh, now, it's important to note that only 1.5 percent of our genome uh, consists of exons, which code for proteins. Uh, and it used to be thought that the remainder of the genome was uh, relatively silent. Um, but that is not the case. There are significant contributions of those areas of the genome, uh, which uh, I will discuss uh, in a little while. The human, evolu human evolutionary tree is not the uh, one line. Uh, at least that's not what our anthropologists uh, teach us. But instead, it appears more like a bushy tree that uh, there were various lineages that arose over time, some of these uh, perhaps uh, mating with others uh, in some way. And ultimately, we as a species uh, uh, ultimately uh, ended up. We share actually 4% of our genome uh, with that of Neanderthals and Denoisovans. Uh, that um, uh, belief was uh, uh, initially 
uh, not thought to be the case because um, the initial studies looked at uh, mitochondrial genome uh, in Neanderthals, and there was uh, not found to be any um, interbreeding among uh, Neanderthals and modern man in terms of uh, the mitochondrial genome. But when a nuclear genome uh, has been looked at, and that done most recently, uh, it's found that uh, there's a contribution of Neanderthal genome and uh, another early species referred to as denoisovin uh, to the human genome. Uh, it appears, therefore, that uh, interbreeding occurred in at least two episodes. With Neanderthal, it's believed to have occurred in the Middle East shortly after we as a species left Africa uh, roughly 100,000 uh, years ago. And with denoisovins, it's believed to have occurred about 40,000 years ago. And uh, their genome is seen uh, chiefly or exclusively, I should say, among uh, Melanesian and Australian Aborigines. So these are some of the earlier hominid species. Uh, actually, Australopithecus preceded the hominid species. Uh, this uh, find, uh, referred to as Lucy, was uh, one of the most important finds in anthropology. Uh, this uh, particular species, Australopithecus afarensis, lived 4 to 2.7 million years ago. There are about 300 skeletal remains that have been found uh, of this uh, species, Lucy being the most famous. Uh, she was found in Ethiopia. She was uh, under 4 feet tall, and uh, the males of this species were twice the size of the females. Uh, it was studying the species that led to the understanding that actually bipedalism, that is walking on two feet, uh, seems to have uh, preceded uh, expansion of the uh, uh, brain, but also seems to have preceded the loss of the woodlands uh, east of the Rift Valley. Uh, so they had some human characteristics, uh, which included an upright stance, arched feet and long thumbs, but they also had ape characteristics, a small size, an arm to leg length uh, that is 95%, whereas in man it's only 70%, a smaller brain, hunched shoulders, and curved fingers. The drive to bipedalism is not uh, known for certain, but some of the theories that have been proposed include improved ambulation, uh, and the advantage of improved ambulation is your ability to get from one place to the other quickly, particularly where no trees exist uh, to swing from. It also permitted free use of the upper extremities, as, and uh, perhaps as importantly, it permitted dissipation of heat. <clears throat> there were significant skull differences between the Australopithecus and modern human. Uh, these uh, primates had uh, what's referred to as a sagittal crest. This is an area uh, on the skull that uh, extends over the top of the skull to which very strong muscles are attached that uh, uh, permit uh, chewing. They had a flatter forehead and they had a shorter snout. Um, in the hominoids, hominid species, uh, Homo habilis is uh, an important actor. Uh, this is really the first human ancestor, or has been referred to as the first human ancestor. Uh, this species existed from 2.2 to 1.6 million years ago. Uh, and it's important to note that uh, these are fairly long-lived species. Recall that we as a species, Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, have probably been around no more than 120 to 140,000 years. Uh, this species was initially found in the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. The brain is 30% larger uh, than Australopithecus africanus. Um, it too exhibited sexual dimorphism in that the males were significantly larger than the females. And we see the use of tools uh, among these uh, animals. They uh, used hand axes and flakes. Homo erectus uh, is a, a subsequent species in this lineage, um, existing between 2 million years ago and 400,000 years ago. The skeleton of 
Homo erectus is very similar to Homo sapiens, including its height. Uh, it immigrated out of Africa about one million years ago. So the emigration from Africa uh, that occurred with Homo sapiens sapiens was actually uh, predated by emigration of other hominids out of uh, Africa, in particular Homo erectus, um, uh, to uh, various areas uh, of the world, and uh, that will be discussed uh, shortly. Um, this uh, was a fairly uh, refined species in that it was capable of adapting to various climates. Um, it used uh, high tech in developing stone tools, and there's evidence that Homo erectus was uh, both capable of uh, navigating the seas, uh, at least to a limited extent, uh, and there's also a paper that talked about its use of toothpicks in cleaning their teeth. Uh, evidenced by the wear at the gum line of existing teeth. It is also postulated that Homo erectus uh, used fire. Their brains were 900 to 1200 cc's. It's 50 percent greater than the size of Homo habilis. The larger size approaches that of Homo sapiens. Uh, and over time, uh, within the species, there was an evolution of both the face and the skull, as indicated uh, in the bottom picture. Um, we have had a fascination with uh, Neanderthal man, uh, referred to as Homo sapiens Neanderthalis. Their bones were first discovered in the Neander Valley in Germany in 1857, uh, misidentified for what they were initially, and only later um, discovered to be bones of, uh, of uh, related ancestor species. They uh, were around for quite a long time, at least uh, 180,000 years ago to 30,000 years ago, and probably significantly further back than that. Uh, this species was widely distributed in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Um, it was able to survive the glacial period, so uh, it was able to survive uh, bitter cold. And it existed uh, contemporaneously with Homo sapiens sapiens. So as Cro-Magnon uh, um, spread into Western Europe, uh, it almost certainly encountered uh, Neanderthal, and that is uh, likely to have been true in many other places as well, such as the Middle East. The Neanderthal had a prominent nose, a long face, a sloping forehead, and big skulls. Uh, their limb bones were twice the size of, uh, of modern man's, uh, and it's been said that the average Neanderthal was uh, stronger than the strongest man alive. Uh, another interesting feature about Neanderthal is that their brains were actually larger on average than that of modern man. That didn't necessarily make them any smarter. Recall that the encephalization index um, um, corrects for uh, body mass, uh, and the Neanderthal actually had a greater body mass than modern man. Uh, the f distinguishing features of its skull were a prominent brow, a uh, large nasal opening, a small mentalis, a chin, and several other features that anthropologists refer to as the Santa Luca characteristics. Uh, however, were you to dress a Neanderthal up and put him on the New York City subway, uh, he would probably be indistinguishable from uh, anyone else on the subway. Um, so the Neanderthal brain was larger, but it was proportional to its body mass. And one of the things that is seen, and this is depicted in the slide here, is that the frontal lobes, these areas of our brain, uh, in Cro-Magnon, or uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, actually uh, expanded relative uh, to what was seen in the Neanderthal brain. And this is a picture depicting uh, a, the skulls of some of the species that I've talked about, Australopithecus uh, on the uh, far left, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and modern man or Homo sapiens sapiens. The Neanderthal had a culture. It clearly was able to clothe itself. As I said, it survived in bitterly cold weather. It hunted large game. 
Uh, it used uh, stone tools. These tools have been referred to as Mousterian tools uh, that have changed little with time. Uh, they exhibited burial rituals and there's evidence that they cared for the infirm. Evidence for that in such things as the healed fracture seen here in the slide uh, that uh, indicated that this person had been cared for uh, as the bone had knitted over uh, quite a while before. Um, and as uh, with some other species, uh, the Neanderthal went on to populate uh, a fairly extensive area of Europe and Asia. Uh, however, it's only when we get to modern man, uh, who appears to have left the African continent about 120,000 years ago, that um, we see distribution uh, of the species uh, across the globe. Now to have a large brain is costly and uh, to understand that you have to know what the energy demand of the brain is. Uh, the human brain is three times the size of that of our nearest living primate relative. Uh, it weighs um, uh, roughly two and a half percent of our total body weight yet it consumes 20 to 25 percent of uh, the energy. It receives 15 percent of the output of our heart. Uh, the cerebral blood flow is 50 to 55 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. Uh, it's twice as high in a child in the gray matters of our brain, which is the surface of our brain and deep nuclear structures, uh, actually get a much higher blood flow, 80 to 100 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. The brain, unlike many other organs, does not store glucose, so there's a constant demand for glucose, and 25% of the body's glucose consumption is by the brain. So we see that the brain uh, requires an enormous amount of energy, uh, and that is costly. What the brain requires this energy for are a number of things. Uh, one is it has to maintain uh, cell integrity, uh, the plasma membrane. It has to maintain a gradient, at least the neurons have to maintain a gradient of uh, electrolytes that is energy consuming. Uh, there are um, neurochemicals that are made uh, by cells within the brain. Uh, so there's a synaptic apparatus and transmitter synthesis, all requiring a, a lot of energy. Uh, and the brain is very vulnerable to failures in energy, be it the consequence of oxygen uh, deprivation, blood deprivation, or glucose deprivation. So why did we develop larger brains? Of what value is uh, the larger brain? And there are a number of theories underlying this drive for larger brains. One is referred to as the food acquisition uh, theory, or Machiavellian, that, that in order to compete for resources in the wild, uh, the larger brain enabled us to do so. Another theory, and these are not mutually exclusive, is the cultural intelligence hypothesis that our larger brains permitted us to transmit skills and information to subsequent generations and also permitted a behavioral flexibility. And a third theory is the social brain hypothesis, that brain size correlated with the complexity of our species social groups. There are certain innate universal features of the human mind as uh, discussed by uh, Dutton in The Art Instinct. Uh, these include such things as an intuitive sense of number, uh, feeling for probability, a capacity to track the frequency of events, the ability to read facial expressions, uh, and a precise ability to throw objects, a fascination with organized pitch, sound, and rhythm uh, as an intuitive sense of economics and a sense of justice. Uh, also unique among our species is the use of language uh, and, and our intelligence, although uh, clearly um, there are very intelligent animals as well that are not uh, homo sapiens. Uh, Sternberg proposed a triarchic theory of intelligence analytic intelligence, creative intelligence, and practical intelligence. There are other ways of uh, dividing uh, forms of intelligence. 
Uh, I personally happen to like this one. Analytic intelligence being your ability to reason, uh, which translates into your ability to uh, perform well on certain standardized tests. Creative intelligence is your ability to be creative, uh, be it a musical genius, uh, writing a book, or doing some other creative uh, activity. And the last is practical intelligence, which deals with uh, your ability to uh, exploit your surroundings and, uh, and um, your social environment and interact with other individuals. Alfred North Whitehead said in The Importance of Language, let it be admitted then that language is not the essence of thought, but this conclusion must be carefully limited. Apart from language, the retention of thought, the easy recall of thought, the interweaving of thought into higher complexity, and the communication of thought are all gravely limited. So Whitehead was of the belief that language was uh, very important, pivotal perhaps, uh, in our um, development as a species. Therefore, we should talk a little bit about language, which is a form of digital communication using phonemes. There are an infinite number of combination of sounds, and as with genes, the root of language can be traced backwards. Uh, so it appears that as with genes, the greatest diversity is of languages is in Africa. Uh, the, that suggests that language is actually developed in Africa. Uh, the derivation has been estimated to be at least 100,000 years ago, although this is uh, subject to uh, some question. And uh, click languages that one finds in uh, southern portions of Africa are uh, believed to be among the earliest types of languages uh, that uh, we as a species used. Currently, there are 7,000 extant, extant languages um, in isolated uh, regions. The languages may develop uh, uniquely. Uh, and therefore, on the island of New Guinea, which is only 312,000 square miles, it's said that there are more than 800 distinct languages. That constitutes about 12% of all the recognized languages. Similarly, where uh, we have been isolated as a species in small pockets, as on the island of Vanuata, uh, northwest of Australia, uh, there are said to be greater than 100 languages, yet the area is only 4,000 square miles. What we find about language is that we as a species are hardwired for it. It's found in all human societies. It's found in all societies that, it, that have ever been known to exist. There's no correlation between grammatical complexity and cultural complexity. So we find cultures that are relatively primitive having uh, very uh, complex grammatical structures uh, and the converse as well. Uh, there are many non-functional and non-transmitted universals of language, such as the inversion of words for questions. Uh, there is an equipotentiality for language among all racial and ethnic species, and there's a poor correlation between language typology and historical relatedness of languages, except over short periods of time. Language is universal across individuals within a society, and there is no formal instruction needed to acquire language, which has led uh, some uh, individuals like Ch Noam Chomsky to suggest that we are indeed hardwired for it. Uh, language is uh, largely the consequence of a particular area of the brain uh, that is depicted here in the outlined area in red. And one anticipates that as we evolved as a species, uh, this area would increase in complexity uh, and size, and it appears that indeed uh, that is the case. As mentioned, a language is a tool for disseminating knowledge and culture, and the archaeologist uh, Clive Gamble said probably all humans before us, like the apes they evolved from, could only work through face-to-face -face encounters but with the rise of language, people were liberated from proximity and could communicate through space and time. And what one sees here uh, is that as our brains grew in dimension, the uh, cultural, our cultural abilities uh, changed rather significantly. So 
what one sees on the y-axis is the size of the brain, and on the x-axis, uh, uh, among others, the uh, technical and cultural innovations. And what I've done here is to circle stone tools at the bottom, and you see the development of stone tools occurred when brain sizes were roughly 900 cc's. Uh, in this particular slide, uh, one sees the uh, development of barbed points and of fishing, uh, which is correlated uh, roughly with brain sizes somewhat higher at 1,000 to 1,100 cc's. And uh, then with the development of art, uh, as I will show you, we see that the brain sizes are that of modern man. And uh, this is uh, from a Scientific American article uh, demonstrating uh, the change in uh, culture uh, over time, with uh, stone blades being apparent uh, at least 200 and maybe more million, uh, 200,000 years ago, uh, and uh, images uh, being evident uh, 80 to 40,000 years ago. Uh, and some of these images are, are depicted here, uh, a carved statue of, uh, of a Venus, uh, cave art uh, in this uh, superior middle panel, um, the um, burial uh, of an individual with uh, pieces of jewelry, and lastly at the bottom, uh, a, a flute that was made out of bone. And here's some of the cave art that one finds at Lascaux. Uh, in uh, southwestern France. So uh, we then come to the evolution of a creative culture. Did working memory spark a creative culture? And this has been referred to as the Wynn and Coolidge theory, that working memory is, in essence, the blackboard of the mind. Or was creative culture simply a reflection of social interaction? Another theory that had been proposed by Boyd and Shannon. Mark Pagel and Wired for Culture said, we owe our big brains less to inventiveness than to conflicts of interest among social minds engaged in arms race to be the best at manipulating others. Uh, obviously, uh, he believes in that, uh, the importance of that social theory for the expansion of the brain. And uh, there's a number referred to as Dunbar's number, which is the practical limits to the size of a group that can successfully interact and function at a personal level. In primates uh, that interact with mutual grooming and, and other means like that, uh, the limit is uh, roughly uh, 60 individuals. Um, the limit of the size of such groups is directly proportional to the size of the neocortex. For modern humans, uh, the uh, groups with which we can interact average 148 and go up to as many as 220. Therefore, the larger your brain, uh, the larger brain size, I should say, uh, permits more complex social interactions. Uh, and that gets to the um, theory of mind, uh, which involves large uh, numbers of regions of the brain. So it includes uh, that area of the brain that is where the face is represented, the inferotemporal cortex, the physical presence of another being, the extrastriate body area, an analysis of body motion, which is the superior temporal sulcus, a simulation of like me, which is uh, in the mirror neurons of the inferior frontal and parietal cortex, and uh, lastly, uh, the junction of the left temporal parietal uh, area, which is uh, where the theory of mind uh, resides. And this was first proposed, the theory of mind, by Sigmund Freud. Uh, the network uh, was proposed by Leslie Brothers. And this is a uh, picture, a color-coded picture of those areas of the brain that are essential for uh, theory of mind. So how did larger, more complex brains evolve? Well, there are four forces in evolution. They include a mutation, any change in genetic material and source of new variation, uh, natural selection, which is successful gene transmission, uh, genetic drift, which are random factors that affect the gene pool, and gene flow and migration. Uh, and it's believed that gene duplication has been critical 
uh, in this process so that as we evolve, genes would be duplicated. The function of the gene would remain, but the duplicate gene uh, now could take on another task with, uh, mo with modification of its genetic structure. However, uh, it turns out that uh, there's simply not enough of those duplicated genes to explain the differences in complexity in our brain, and it now appears that regions of our genome, uh, the non-coding regions of our genome, are critically important uh, to uh, brain development because they regulate uh, these genes, both upregulating them and downregulating them. Uh, and it appears that man, uh, depicted on the far right on this slide with uh, the red bar, uh, has more non-protein coding DNA to protein coding uh, DNA than any other species, and many of these uh, have been linked in some way uh, to brain function and development. Um, the, the importance of this is that really only 1.2 percent of our genome codes for proteins. We have roughly 21 to 23,000 genes coding for proteins. Um, and to change those genes uh, requires a tremendous amount of energy. On the other hand, to change a, uh, an RNA uh, requires only 20 percent of that energy, so it's much easier to change a non-coding region of the DNA than a coding region responsible for protein. Uh, those regions, by the way, that are non-coding are very sensitive to intracellular and environmental stimuli. They interact broadly with DNA, RNA, and proteins. And uh, the protein changes, on the other hand, require extensive changes in the network and have been um, hypothesized to require uh, 10 million years of evolutionary change in order to affect the change in a protein. What's our future? Well, over the last 10,000 years, uh, it appears that we've evolved 100 times faster than at any other time since the split of earliest hominid ancestors. Uh, that uh, is somewhat counterintuitive. We don't think that we're still evolving, but indeed we are. Uh, at least that's what the evidence suggests. Uh, genetic analysis shows greater than 300 regions of genome with recent change providing survival advantage. And some of the examples include changes in skin color and the ability to digest milk with the enzyme lactase. Uh, my own belief is, is that uh, as we learn more about the genes dictating uh, human intelligence, we will likely tinker with it. Uh, and there have been uh, at, in animal uh, experiments uh, the ability to improve memory and improve uh, in, intelligent uh, uh, behavior uh, among uh, lesser animals. However, as uh, Niels Bohr and, uh, and Yogi Berra both said, uh, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future.